it is the Schomburg Center, to me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exist at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up. And to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the Cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes. And I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Hello. Yeah, clapping is good. Schomburg Center. Woo! Welcome to the Schomburg Center this afternoon for a discussion um, of, uh, related to H2O Hip Hop Archives. I'm Shala Lynch, the curator of the Moving Image and Recorded Sound Division. We're located on the third floor of the original Harlem Library, or the side of the building where the main exhibition space is above art and artifacts. The division is the steward of more than 350 special collections that are literally the voices and movements of black history and culture. While we are still growing our hip hop holdings in terms of special collections, so we have LPs and it's so da da, um, and actually music videos too, but in terms of special collections, um, we have Fab Five Freddy's material, which is being digitized and will be available soon. And we have the Hip Hop Education Collection that we've been featuring in the division all day during the open house. This collection was collected and donated by Martha Diaz. Um, the collection is primarily from the Hip Hop Odyssey, that's where the H2O comes from. It took me a while to figure that out. I know you're faster than I am. So the Hip Hop Odyssey International Film Festival that she founded in 2002. And includes more than 400 hip hop related films, 400. Um, I will also add that Martha interned for the Moving Image and Recorded Sound Division in 2014, she'll correct me if I got that wrong, and produced the first inventory for her collection while completing her master's in Moving Image Archiving and Preservation at NYU. This woman is perseverant and talented, and so it is no surprise she is here today to moderate the conversation about the H2O Hip Hop Archive. Please give a warm Schomburg welcome to Martha Diaz, who will introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Shala. Thank you, Shala. Oh my god. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm going to ask my esteemed panel to come out and join me and on stage. Let's just get into it, right? Let's just get into it. I'll, I'll say <laughs> Gabe made it. Yes. yes. Oh, my God. This is, this is a hip hop jam. Yes, and yeah, sit right here, right next to us. Yep. Wow, this is uh, so special to, uh, every time I come to the Schomburg, it's really, um, it is a home. For me, um, this is where I feel I matured into uh, a scholar. Um, you know, I, I was a community organizer uh, when I started, well, I began the festival and that introduced me to community organizing because I wasn't considered an activist. I came from the entertainment industry. I started out at Yo MTV Raps. That's a long time ago. Many people are like, what is that? Yes, actually this year is my 30th anniversary of interning at Yo MTV Raps. And so I was a filmmaker, am a filmmaker, media producer, and um, I've worked on films in Hollywood and music videos. And then one day I decided I'm going to use my skills and um, talents to help my community. I was disillusioned with the entertainment industry. I hated how they portrayed us. And so I wanted to counter that narrative by creating a platform, another platform. And so uh, I created short films and then I submitted them to different festivals and I did the whole film circuit, film festival circuit. And then one day I entered this one festival, which I, I won't name, um, and they said, yeah, we're gonna, include you in the lineup, you, you know, they emailed me, they're like, you're in. And then I get a letter saying, you're rejected. 
sorry, we can't include you. I was baffled. I called them, like, what's going on? And they said, well, you got bumped off. There's another movie. It was like a love and basketball movie. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna create my own film festival so no other hip hop filmmaker will go through this. And so I called Gabe, and I called Tanya, and I called all my friends, filmmakers, and I said, we're gonna, let's, let's do this film festival. Then Elise, and I just, that, that was my introduction to community organizing. And, and you know, prior to that, I was, um, I went to South Africa with the Malcolm X grassroots movement, with Dream Hampton and Dead Prez and Lumumba and Monifa. And that was really like the primer for me to really understand the inequalities. I mean, I already saw it here, but seeing it in South Africa was really heightening, you know, like just really shocking. And to see that young people over there were organizing, creating their events, selling merch, doing whatever they needed to do to survive, really made me think, hey, I'm not really doing enough. I'm not, I have to do something. And then the letter came and then that's what I said. I said, I'm gonna create a film festival. And so 20 years later, I've, I have like four other careers. I'm a curator, I'm an archivist, I'm an educator, I'm a mama, I'm doing it all. And, um, and so to be here, because this is where, we started in the Bronx Museum, but the Schomburg was like our sister location. And to come back 20 years later and to celebrate all that we've accomplished. And I know that we're gonna play the loop of movies, of movies, of pictures. pictures yeah. yeah, so we're gonna just show some of the images of the people who came to our festival, who, you know, now are superstars. Like, they're in politics, they're running shit. They are, I mean, you will see them, hopefully, um, soon. And, and, you know, a lot of people had their jump start through our festival, and they were able to even create more festivals. And so I'm very proud of this work, and I invited a few friends to talk about their experience, you know, for us to just reflect on the challenges, on the good, the bad, the ugly. And I'm going to begin with... Gabriel Tolliver, because we were working at YoMTV Raps together. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. YoMTV Raps. Yes. And can you please introduce yourself properly, because I'm just not doing a good job with that. Uh, you're doing fine. Hi, I'm Gabriel Tolliver, uh, media maker, and uh, yeah, just blessed to have been a part of this uh, festival, and uh, also a veteran. Um, yeah, I make things basically. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Do you remember when I when I told you about the festival? Yes, you called me. Um, you said you had this idea for a festival, and it needed to go up in a, a couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, it was a little overwhelming at first, but um, you know, you assembled a a good team, and uh, we had it at that place near Bryant Park, right? That was like the first. Well, that, that was the Odyssey Awards. Oh, that's the Odyssey. Oh, yeah, but right now, the Bronx Museum. The Bronx Museum of right. the Arts. Right, I remember that. I had to come from Brooklyn all the way up to the Bronx. <laughs> and no, no diss to the Bronx. Uh, it was just, you know, the fall and it's kind of cold out. But um, yeah, I mean, that space was amazing. I mean, it was, uh, and yeah, just the, the people that you assembled that, you know, I mean, I think I met Elise there, right? that was the very first time. And Black Rob and Tamara. Tamara. I mean, so, um, and Tanya and Trisha, uh, because we had all those early meetings and stuff like that. So it was a very, um, it was a very formative time. 
in terms of uh, making um, you know just meaningful connections um, with folks and stuff. And uh, yeah, we 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 made it happen. You know, yes. we made it happen. Yes, so. I mean it was really a few weeks um, <laughs> because I don't know. 9-11 happened yeah. in 2021, I mean 2001, 2001. And, um, and we were in South Africa during that time, right days before we were there. And so when we arrived, 9-11 um, happened. And so in January, that's when I decided, okay, it's time to do something. But I never, ran a film festival. So, I mean, I've attended Tribeca and I, you know, I had an idea, but I didn't, I've never raised money. I didn't know how to organize it, but I had common sense and I have great people, friends around me. So I assembled an advisory board. And I remember Gabe was the first person I called, and then Tania Cuevas Martinez, who's another excellent filmmaker from the Bay Area. She was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, she, like everyone was gun ho we, we didn't have our own platform. We had to go to other film festivals to showcase our stories. And so we go to the Bronx. I forgot who introduced me to the Bronx. We, I would go to the Bronx Museum to jam out because they would have like these hip hop parties and I met the the executive director or education director and I said hey can we do a, a festival here and Ron Ron Cavanaugh Ron Cavanaugh yes from Fr Freedom Literacy Project it's the Literacy Freedom Project oh can y'all hear me yes excuse yes. me uh, Ron Cavanaugh in the Bronx with the uh, Mosaic. He ha it's a uh, literary magazine that he founded and continues to this day to self-publish. And also his project, Literary Freedom Project literary freedom. In, in the Bronx. Yes. That's who we connected with. So we connected with him. He connected us. The Bronx Museum said, okay, no problem. And I was like, that was easy. And then, and then Elise brought us here, and we had a meeting with Dr. Dotson. And um, do you want to talk about that, Elise? Because this is this is well home sure. to you too. Yeah, this is a home. Uh, my name is Elise Dotson Emery. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I was blessed and fortunate to be a part of this phenomenal team that forged a very important yet strong and sturdy path to do exactly what Martha said, which was to provide a platform for those individuals, first of all, who loved hip hop, who were living and breathing and pushing hip hop forward as a culture, as a movement and such, who were using that to tell their stories on film and in other forms of media as well. I, at the time, I connected with this beautiful group of folk. I think I was still at HBO. I had worked, I think I still was, thank you, at HBO. My job at HBO was primarily in marketing, but, I'm sorry, generally in marketing, but my primary um, responsibility was to create websites for a lot of the different shows. So I did content and produce websites for The Sopranos, for Oz, Sex in the City, uh, uh, The Wire, which came later, um, all the black stuff, if you will, which they gave to me. I didn't mind, it was cool, because it was beautiful. It's, it's, and I got, to, I got a chance to touch these projects and help to I guess sort of craft their image online. And this is at a time, many of y'all who may younger, this was at a time when dot com was just emerging. So they thought we were just a bunch of nerds walking around in our pajamas drinking coffee. Oh, well, they don't do anything. Um, but it was very important. It was pivotal. At the same time I was doing that, I was very active in the film community. I spent about 13 years as a um, supporter and volunteer with the Urban World Film Festival under uh, Stacy uh, Spikes' leadership, mostly because, again, in similar fashion as uh, Martha and this team um, 
worked for, it was about providing a space, providing a platform for unheard voices and others who were having experiences like Martha's, trying to get their pieces, their art, their message out to the public, out in industry circles to expand their reach, but also acquire even more resources of community and of course funds, because we know money, there it is, but we, it's not always there for us. But to get your stories told, so I was already doing that, and I also helped founded a couple of other film festivals as well. So I was looking to continue that side of my work. When I heard about this opportunity, I think it was Tanya or you, I, I, I'm 61, this is 20 years ago, it's cloudy. I remember some of the, you know, the key pieces. But I came to, Creator brought me here. Creator said, no daughter, you need to be over here. And I willingly went. I knew about film festivals, a lot of the things that Martha expressed that they did not know about film festivals, i.e., you can't really pull it off in a matter of weeks. You kind of have to go a year in advance and work backwards, particularly if you don't have half a million dollars in your pocket. So I brought those skills to the table, also the sensibility about filmmaking, folk, it, it's, it's, it is not an elitist piece. If you can think it and speak it and write it and take a picture like this man, this person is doing here, or y'all are taking pictures, you can do it and you should be able to do it and you should not have to compromise whatever your vision is or your story just so that you can get a dollar, just so that Fiddy can come and put you on power. No, you should be able to do your work the way you need to and be successful at it. So. These folks allowed me to come into their space, and it was a joy. It was a joy. To your point, Martha, and then I'm gonna shut up because I know I'm talking a lot. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the connection with the Schomburg Center is my father, Howard Dodson, was the chief of the Schomburg Center for 20-something years. So for me, he, as a matter of fact, he helped build this structure. He helped build this building. Praises to him, yes. And those of us in the house who endured those long hours, daddy, go to bed, whatever. <laughs> um, but the Schomburg Center and all of its history and legacy is something I was hoping that I could bring to the H2O table because this is the place where we need it to be. And when the opportunity came and I brought it and it was like, yes, let's do it, let's go for it. And we ended up having Odyssey, what, what we, we had screenings here, I think. Odyssey, we had screenings here, Pan uh, panels, Odyssey Awards, everything. It, it was really, really beautiful. And community turned out. It sort of secured our legacy as a, a collective, if you will, a team that was representing you, was representing our community. The community entrusted us with something that it identified that it needed, and that's what we were doing. Literally, I mean, it was beautiful. Thank you, it, you opened the door. And, um, you know, I would visit the Schomburg, but I didn't really know anyone. I wasn't an insider, but I had the connect, the plug. And so she made it happen. And as a matter of fact, I wanna, can we play the loop, please? The pictures, the images? What's going on? Is somebody taking a break? Um, I, I also want to acknowledge that you know we have a couple of chairs here because I, I, I wanted to see who would show up and, and if there were any luminaries that would maybe want to talk about their experience. And so I see a few people. Um, well, I see Easy AD, I see Say Two Heart, I see Fiona. Bloom. Um, I can't say beyond the third row. row. <laughs> um, but if anybody wants to join us, please come through and you have a seat and we will hear you and your experience. Thank you. Thank you, AZAD, for the cold crush. Give it up. Okay, so we finally have a space. We finally have the filmmakers. We finally, you know, figure this thing out structurally what we want to do. And we realize we have to make 
we have to raise money. We have to, there's no way around it. There's certain costs that you have to pay, like the technicians. Um, this is still a union house, right? So the Schomburg is a union house, meaning yeah. you, you gotta pay, yeah. right? Yes, I hear the work is like Shala's, yes, yes. And so there were just the minimum, you know, we just had to raise the minimum, which was like maybe 20,000, maybe, yeah. And, and we, I remember like one year we raised like 5,000 and that's how we did it. We, it was a lot of in-kind services. And I remember going to the industry and saying, hey, you need to be part of this. You are you know, part of hip hop, you need to support this, and people showed up. Whether they spoke on panels, and I've never paid a panelist. Never paid anyone, really. No, we never got paid. Actually, we never got paid. No. We used all of the money for the events. And so, we needed to party. Right? We needed to also enjoy it, right? not just work, work, work. And so when it was time to look for a corporation or a company, a spirit company, we found one. <laughs> and it was because of this sister that I'm about to introduce. Because of this sister, we had our first real sponsor. You were our first sponsor, actually. Yes. So. Tamara Gardellis, thank you. Thank you for believing thank in you. us. Thank you for taking a chance, investing in us. What made you do that? And tell us a little bit about your trajectory. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be back with all of you brilliant people. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so my name is Tamara Gardellis. And um, currently, I'm a director of strategy for an advertising agency. Um, but I have a 20-something <clears> 20, 20 year career in uh, marketing, advertising, and media. So similar to what Martha was saying, from a fairly young age, I recognized the power of the image. I recognized the power of, of media <clears throat> and recognized the importance um, for our community, our people, to be able to tell our stories. Um, so when I got out of school, I worked with Spike Lee. That was my first job out of school, was Spike DDB, um, Spike Lee's advertising agency. And then I found myself working with Reverend Al Sharpton. I headed his youth program for a, a while, um, you know, and that's where I got my, my first taste of activism. Um, I moved over into being the uh, director of programs for the Amadou Diallo Foundation. I'm not sure who, who might remember Amadou. This is the good, good people to know them, to know him. Um, and then I was offered a fairly sizable amount of money to go corporate, <laughs> onto the corporate side. So onto the corporate side I went. I worked for um, a company, you guys uh, may have remembered, Seagram's. Um, Pernod Ricard bought the Seagram's portfolio, so they bought in a, a significant number of African-American brands, is how they referred to them. So Seagram's Gin Martel Cognac, and basically I became <clears throat> the event marketing PR manager um, for Martel Cognac and Seagram's Gin, um, which was an awesome position <clears throat> because it allowed me to sit on top of a budget. And basically it was my job to provide sponsorship um, to different properties, different type of programming, um, to make sure that our brands were ingrained in the community um, but the way that I thought about it was it gave me the opportunity to invest directly into the community. Um, so for the years that I was with Martel Cognac and Seagram's Gin, I pumped about $8 million into black film. Uh, I had, you know, three concert tours. I sponsored independent film, uh, independent film screenings in eight markets. And it was literally the joy of my career. It is my pride, it, it is my pride and joy to this day. Uh, and so I'm thankful, you know, to be counted amongst, you know, those who were able to put this together. Um, I had my piece of the puzzle. I wasn't a creative. I didn't make the films. I was happy to be in the room, <laughs> you know, at the time. Um, but it was a very important piece. Um, and I think I rec recognized that, you know, then. 
Um, I don't think people realize today, you know, with all the, the platforms, the Netflix and the Amazons and the importance of hip hop today, how difficult it was back then, um, what the battle was and how much of an uphill battle it really was for who I refer to as our artist historians, um, those who hold the responsibility of telling these stories. And again, how important it is, um, you know, to lay the foundation to those who come after us to know those stories. And so, you know, again, I, I jumped at the opportunity. I think the film platform was already in place. Um, and I don't even remember how we first met Martha, but it just sounded awesome. I was like, count me in, <laughs> like, you know? It might have been, it might have been like, yes. with, with Sincere, yeah, I was, that crew. Yes. Sincere, Ari Frontline right? Marketing, yeah. And it was, it was really like immediately a, a, a family event, you know? It was, like you said, Sincere and Aria and Frontline Marketing, you know, uh, Mums, you know, Rest in Peace, hosted one of the, the Odyssey festivals. And I mean, it was just, it was, it was a ball. <laughs> we, had a, we had a great time. But it served, you know, it served an important, important pur purpose. Um, and I was, and like I said, it still remains one of my proudest moments, you know, to know that when it was necessary, I was in position and able to step up and write that check. Thank you for that. And you continue to support us in every way. She was on panels and, you know, we remain friends. And that's one of the, the I think my, my favorite part of this project is that I've remained friends with many of the people. And, um, and you are my, my, my homie, we've partied beyond the festival. Um, so money, check. Mm -hmm. Venue, check. Advisors, workers that could curate and manage and coordinate with me, check, check, check. But we needed more. We needed an army of volunteers to really get this done. And when we called, you know, had the call to action, please join us. We had about 60 more, like 100 volunteers. And, and Black Rob, you were one of them. This is true. And, and so, you, I don't know, I don't think you were a part of the first festival. I came a little later on after I think it was going for a while. And how I met you is because I was doing another film event with my friends Leo and um, Nectarios, an event called Film Blitz. Film I, was Blitz. Doing, I was doing that. And I was working on another event that was about um, art of music, music, musicians and helping them do their job and independent artists and things like that. It was called Gems in New York. And I forgot her name. She's going to kill me. And she brought... I was I spent out a call for volunteers, and she brought an army of kids. Oh, maybe a Maris. A Maris, exactly. A Maris she brought Mesa. an army of yes. kids <laughs> to my event. I was. I like, invited her. Where did these I kids hope come from. I was like, Maris in the how house. This happened, and yeah. and the festival was something I always knew about, but I was like, I want to go to that, but I never got to it, especially since I'm from the Bronx and. It was in the Bronx, and I was like, I want to go to that, but I never, never made it because I'm running around like a crazy person doing a hundred different things. And I met you, and I was like, Oh, you do that? That's great. That's awesome. That's like, this is really cool. I, I said, I want to go to this. And I, we were doing something after that that um, it was the first event that I worked with with H two O, and it, it was a film festival. It was, not, it was a film screening event for hip hop documentaries. And it, what, did we call, what did we call it? We called docs. it Hip Hop Docs. Yeah. No, it was the New York City Docs. No, it was Hip Hop Docs. No, but we yeah. did our docs. No, it was me and you. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had like half the films. You brought in like half the films. And it was at the event, a space called Freight. Oh, Freight. Yes. Yes. It was Hip Hop Docs. Yeah, and the, it, it had a little bit of a longer name, which I'm not going to say because I don't think I barely remember what it is. And... And we just hit it off. We just like we just clicked and was like, yeah, Martha's cool. She's like doing all these cool things, and like we were connected on so many other levels than just like the festival. And anytime I was involved with anything outside of the festival, I would try to bring it in. <laughs> it was like uh, I'm working for this company that does this. Zip car. You yes. got a zip car. We got. We had free transportation. Yes. <laughs> that we were able to pick up artists. 
you know, through the zip cars. Mm -hmm. And thank you. I remember that was a big, big, big sponsor. Yeah. And um, what else? And I like to call myself a serial job changer because uh, I'll tell you the story. I started a new job three weeks ago, but, <laughs> but I'll tell you the story later. Um, um, and like I said, anytime I was involved with anything, I try to bring the festival in or help any of the other people that I know that are kind of working in the space of film festivals. And I went on to work at another film festival in the Bronx. It was called the Bronx International Film Festival, which is the longest running film festival in the Bronx. And we gotta bring that back, but that's besides the point. And um, I began to work on things kind of behind the scenes at the film festival, like archi archiving some of the video that, um, that the video had, that the, the festival had kind of created and putting up on Vimeo and, and what else did I do? Jesus Christ, I'm trying to think. You've done so much yes. to continue um, the movement because this became a movement. Mm -hmm. At this the end true. of the day, it inspired, this film festival inspired others to create other film festivals. It inspired people to create movies. They're like, I'm making a movie just so I can get into your festival. This is true. And then what happened in the second year was that I noticed that filmmakers were actually creating curricula, curriculum for their film festival, for their films. And I found it very curious. I was like, well, I was like, wow, interesting. Because at the time I was teaching, I was a middle school and a high school teacher. I started out as a substitute teacher, then I did the fellows program. and. Um, so I was bringing hip hop into the classroom back then, but seeing the filmmakers bring it to the film festival really um, made me think about other things. And I met a woman named Trisha Wong who was working at, um, what was the, the, the station? Oh my God, it's the public access. Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Yeah, M&N. &N. And so she helped me create a youth category for the festival. And then she was like, what else you want? What else you want to do? And I said, well, I'm noticing that people are doing this hip hop education thing. And I'm, I'm a hip hop educator. And so I want to know who else is doing this. Let's organize a, a, a symposium. And so we did a hip hop education summit. And it was the first festival or summit of its kind, like the similar to the festi film festival. And, um, and we just put out a call to see if anybody was doing it, you know, using integrating hip hop into the, in the classroom. And about 40 people showed up at the Bronx Museum, because we had the space over there again, from all over the country. And I said, whoa, this is serious. People are doing this. And we were sharing information on how we were practicing, you know, how we were using hip hop in the classroom. And, and so that second year, we launched another initiative. Now you lost your chair, Terrence. We're gonna bring you up in a second. We're gonna need another chair. We're gonna need another chair for Tarantino. Cause all the images you're about to see, all the images you're about to see, most of them were taken by Terrence Jennings. Um, and so you helped with the education movement as well because, oh, he's getting the chair because you helped me develop our, li our library. Yes. You know, I was collecting books, I was collecting movies, I, was, I started my own collection. And every time Black Rob would find a book, he's like, Martha, I found you a book. Yeah. <laughs> you a book. So he was my partner in, in developing what is now uh, a hip hop library. Mm -hmm. um, I've got so, a couple other books at home that I want to bring. <laughs> yes, so thank you very much, Rob. I, I love you so much. Okay, so we, are, we got the volunteers, we got the programming, we got the funding, we got the space, but we need to get the word out. And of course, we did our, our street marketing with our flyers. Um, we, there it is, finally, it's coming up. Yes, yes, yes. Um, 
and you know we needed we needed publicity we needed the the media to write about us to to talk about us because we know that's the only way you made it you make it you know through the media so i remember this brother meeting this brother say to and how just how wonderful your energy was like, Martha, oh my God, we could do this. Hey, he had a press release and with Fiona too, just working on the press, just really just, what, what made you believe in us? Like what, what happened? You turn on that mic. There was a couple, there was a, thank you. There was a couple of things. So what Martha doesn't remember is before I got won in the press part. I used to run an art initiative in New York City um, where the work was to make sure art in various, um, in, in various disciplines would be plugged into community, connected with like real-time amazing professionals. And so at one point, you all needed office space. Yeah. And so I first started, right, I, y'all needed office space in the first, yes. and I don't know who I met, and I was like, well, I can at least give office space. And when Martha talks about reining you, and I would end up leaving that job and go back into publicity. And when Martha talks about Incon, trust me, plus, fun fact, <laughs> I know you know where I'm going, right? <laughs> So fun fact, why I knew I had to do anything is because when I saw, this woman's a legend, not just in New York, but when I saw Elise, I know Elise before HBO. I'm not dating myself, but Elise, but Elise was the person, I went to Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. She was like our student, like she held us down in Atlanta, and in Atlanta is where I even got started in anything related to the entertainment industry, where I was very plugged in in fashion and all that. So then come back here to meet Martha, and then to be plugged in, it was an instant belief because of what I believe hip hop has the ability to do and the connection. And so when we get to use our skills and our resources, or as we say, our time, talent, and treasure to have impact, it is the gift that keeps on giving. And because there are other people here, I'll be really quick. And so in the midst of standing on the gift that keeps on giving, nothing Martha Diaz has said here, when we talk about legends and icons and forward thinkers, it starts with people like Martha. Because when Martha talks about friendships also that transcend the test of time, I feel now, me and Martha have been all the world in the world, I, 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 I. And some of the work that I get to, and I, that I move forward now, when I first landed in LA, I live in LA now, and I've been doing a lot of work in film that really, quite frankly, and about not just in producing and making film, but access and opportunity in the film industry, specifically um, across the country, but also very specifically in Atlanta, Georgia, where we're looking at it from racial equity and, and in LA and all these hot spots where people want to tell their stories, right? One of the first people when they found out I was in LA was Martha, who happened to be in LA. She was like, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to be here, you got to be this. And I did all of that. And it really has been the gift that keeps on giving. And this festival, in a way, it was almost easy to plug in PR. And so many times when we have anything that is marginalized or different in that time, you're not given the same resources as everyone else. And once, so it was easy because I knew it was a great product. And so it was me, it was people like Fiona, raise your hand, and also shout out to Vanessa Wakeman. And when we worked, right, right, and when we worked in concert, it was easy either to plug in, get what was, not even extra, what, what was, what you deserved, right? And so this festival, this whole H2O movement, Martha's absolutely right. All these people sitting here, it is a movement, I'm sure it's work. Terrence, in this, in this amazing way he documented, um, where it's a blessing to have the photography that we had. There's so many things that have not even been named yes. about this festival that we could all probably talk, and for me, very personally, it has been a gift that has kept on giving in how I frame the work that I now move forward, and as well as how I show up in these spaces. So thank you 
for including me, right? And having me as a part of the process. Stay too. Come on. I love you so much. I mean, choked up. Mm. I mean, it's really special when people just, they meet you once and they get it. They get you and they put their heart and soul to help you. You know, we're, we're a family for life. And I appreciate everything you've done. And, you know, we still have much more to do. We got a lot more to do. Okay, okay. Can't mess up my makeup. I don't even do this. I don't even do this. I got all dressed up for the 20th. Um, okay, so we got the publicity. We got the space. We got the funding. We have the volunteers. We have a format. And then we have to decide on a program. So I remember Tanya, um, Stacy, Dondry, they all helped curate. And it was pretty easy because people just were sending us films. You know, the first year we had 40 films. The second year we had 65 films. The third year we had 100 films. The fourth year we had over 100 films. And it just kept growing and growing. And so curating was actually easy in a sense that we could program it. It wasn't easy in organizing because we would get films that were in PAL format. They were in different languages from all over the world. And like Shala said, you know, we had, um, we have over 440 films in the archive. And they're wonderful shorts, documentaries, experimental films, um, narratives, all kinds. But, we also wanted to honor these filmmakers and we wanted to honor the pioneers of hip hop because without them, we wouldn't have a festival. I wouldn't be able to shoot, about, shoot a movie about hip hop without the pioneers. And so we were, you know, we gave, I remember Cool Herc and Cindy Campbell and Cindy Campbell their flowers. We gave Bambada and the Zulu Nation their flowers. And we gave many, many more artists their flowers, including Easy AD, who I love so much. And thank you for joining us on stage. You know, you were one of the first people to come to the Schomburg and donate. I, I would give my story. Okay, so I, I, I'm ten, I, want, I want you to talk about that because this is very special. It's, One, two. We, we come, right, we come in full circle here. So please, Thank take you. it Absolutely. away. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Easy AD from the legendary Cold Crush Brothers. One of the few people in the world who helped create hip hop in the world, so I'm honored to be here. Um, History is very important to me. I've been archiving my history, our history from the beginning. I have a large collection of my own. So um, I work right down the block. I worked at the Harlem YMCA. I was the director for the youth program for many, many years. And I ran into Octavia and Mr. Fuller. They used to work here at uh, the Schoenberg. And I kept saying, Octavia, Schoenberg is not really connected. I kept saying it over and over again. They're not connected to the culture of hip hop. Let's do a exhibit uh, of hip hop at the Schomburg. And so we talked for a little while and then I met with Mr. Dodson. We had a meeting with him and he was like, okay, we're with it, let's make it happen. So actually uh, we did the first exhibit here, hip hop exhibit. Uh, we had a big poster out in the front before they had that digital machine outside. It was a poster they used to put outside. And it was just an honor to have uh, the archives here. We donated pictures, flyers, um, and we did the oral history of, of, of hip hop here. So I was actually the first individual to be injected in the Schoenberg Library uh, with the ex uh, hip hop exhibit. It was the Cold Crush Brothers, and we, we had photographs and flyers from 1979 until a couple of 1983. Um, and one of the things is, I remember getting our award, she didn't talk about this, but 
I remember getting our award. So I, I, and we got our award. I think it was at BB King's. Yeah. And they gave us they gave us our award at BB King's. I remember where I can remember exactly. I have a really, really photographic memory. So I, I was wearing a designer. His name was Bobby Brown at the time. I had on my Bobby Brown suit. Uh, not the artist, but Bobby Brown suit, and we got our awards. It was very, very, very nice. And I also remember going coming to a church, um, and they had um, this guy named Ilgis. Ed, 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 he, he he was he, he was doing poetry, and he he, oh, he got booed off the stage. Basically, <laughs> wasn't a good poet, but he's a great actor. Uh, and then the guy from Oz was there also uh, doing poetry and stuff like that. So I've been part of I'm I'm part of the culture in in a very unique way. From the from the beginning, if you can ever if you can picture hip hop from the beginning, I'll just give you this is how I like to give you a little visual. There was no uh, TV turned off. There was only 13 channels on television. Um, there was no internet. There was no cell phones. You had to actually put money in a place in, into a machine and dial the number. So you had to remember the numbers. So I come from that era. But one of the things that I like about the culture in hip hop and also film, um, I also was in part of a film. I was in the first hip hop movie ever made, which was Wild Style. So I'm also in that as well. And I'm, I'm saying I, I'm talking about we as collectively as a group, because no one built the culture by themselves. So when I say I, I mean me, but it's just, I'm just communicating. Um, so here, sitting here in the Schoenberg, um, here is very fascinating. So moving forward, so taking hip hop in education, I'm also the uh, director of education for hip hop public health. Um, and what we do is we inject the culture, and people use that word very loosely, the culture. What does that mean when you inject the culture, right? We inject the visual, the communication, the, uh, the call back and forth, the MCing into education, and we bring it to a whole nother vibration. And a lot of people don't understand the hip hop culture unless you have all those elements at one space. Then you can understand what the culture is about. It's about uplifting, bringing people together, give, and, and education also, and, and, and having fun. Because we had a lot of fun. So I've, I've been full circle, and also in health as well. So we do a calorie literacy program for kids in grades three to six. And actually I've been doing this since 2007. Um, so I, I currently, get checks from two, two organizations that allow me to do that. And I'm very happy to be here. And Martha, me and Martha have met many different times on many different levels. Um, we seem like we always see each other and we're like, oh, how you doing? And we talk about her family, we talk about her daughter. Uh, I remember when her daughter was 13, we had a very, very intense conversation yeah. about her daughter. And you know, I work with young people, so, and I'm, I'm an adult male, but um, I really have not grown up yet. I'm talking about as far as inside myself, Every day I wake up in the morning, I feel like I'm nine and 10 years old. Um, and that's inside myself. I, I have to give the appearance of being an adult. I have to communicate and articulate. But inside me, I am hip hop. And I love the culture, visually, uh, spiritually, um, socially, um, and on a, it's a, just, um, just it's a vibration that brings, brings a whole nother excellence to the world. And when it's used properly, it can uplift the entire planet. So thank you for uh, having me on stage. Well, thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. Easy AD has been an inspiration. His work, please look it up, is really impactful, really making a difference in our communities. And one of the things that I'm also proud of about our festival, as you can see with some of the people that have joined us from Sonia Sanchez right there, and um, that's Sasha Jenkins, who is a great filmmaker, and George Martinez, the first MC to get elected to political office. Sharice Bullock is there, and she's now the chief innovation officer at Urban World. Um, Benny Boom, Martha Cooper, uh, Charlie Ahern, is that Sanaya Lathan? Yes, it is. So she's over at Disney, head writer. Um, Warrington Hudlin, Nelson George, uh, Jam Master Jay's family. Um, is that Yoda? Yes. 
Yes, Dream Hampton, Melvin Van Peebles, The Awesome Two, Bambada, Brian Bain, uh, The Welfare Poets. Yes, and Eli and Maori. Eli Fantauzi, Jacob Fantauzi, and Maori Holmes. They actually created festivals after um, the H2O. The first, Maori created the Black Star Festival in Philly, and Eli created the Fist Up Festival in Oakland. We had so many filmmakers. There you go. Um, we, we wanted to also talk about some of the people we lost along the way that we wish they were here. We really, really, really wish they were here with us. Um, because we always, in, in the festival, gave, gave um, you know, paid tribute to those that we lost. And I remember Rerun was one of the people we honored. There's La Bruja. Um, Roxanne Chante, the pioneers gave me so much love, so, so much love. They just showed up, they would take over. I would say, just, just introduce this award. Um, you know, just, just do something, just host it for a second while I get, you know, another artist. And it really was a community effort. And there's Tony Blackman, there's Drez. Um, so Kanye, oh, that, yeah, we got to talk, yeah, he, yeah, he, Kanye, Kanye, remember, well, before we talk about what he did with Jesus Walks, remember that bill that he left us with? You, 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 you want to talk about it? It, it wasn't that bad. Okay. It was, no, it was a bad bill, but in all fairness, so it's like Kanye said, we know that old Kanye. <laughs> Just shout out to Kanye. I hope he gets one. But no, so Kanye. Except the college album. Kanye left us, uh, we know Kanye that. Left. We know him pre during that era, not what this oh, he, iteration. He literally that's came what and launched the first time he ever performed Jesus Walks was actually at our, was it the after party? Or the, it was a really big. It was at the Odyssey Awards. It was at the Odyssey Awards. I mean, in all fairness to Kanye, he, he came, and I'm so the, we have this joke about this bill. He left us with a huge car service bill when Martha talks about community. And so <laughs> Vanessa and I kind of got to the bottom of it. We, you know, uh, so what really happened was, <laughs> what happened was, 20 years later, this is a true story. So we made up all these tropes about what Kanye could possibly be doing. But what Kanye actually did was Kanye took the car and went back to the studio to work. And when the feedback from what Kanye, why Kanye said he kept the car, he says, well, I did the show for free. I had to go back to work and make some money. And so that's why, for us, it was like, yo, where is this bill? How are we going to pay for it? But in an interesting way to me, and it's always felt interesting, here's this artist, right, for better or for worse, we're talking about almost 20 years ago, who said, yes, I gave my time, my talent. And at the time, he was still an amazing producer. And he said, yeah, I kept the car. But I kept the car and parked it overnight, and we verified that with the driver. So the true story is he went back to do his art, and that's what we were about, and that's why he was aligned with us. And so um, in the midst of everything that sometimes that goes on with Kanye, I keep that very close to my heart because it says something for me at least, right? Not speaking for the organization, about his commitment, not only to an organization at the time that probably couldn't even pay him at the time, but to his own artistry and what that meant for him. Yes, yes. And we, we, we saw him, excuse me, we saw him after that. Actually, Ariel Pallets, who uh, was on one of the pictures, um, in one of the pictures, she's the nightlife mayor. Um, she was our producer for the Odyssey Awards. Another one is um, Gina. What was Gina's last name? Gina Page. Gina Page, our marketing director, the founder of African Ancestry. Black Girls Rock in the house. Keith Murray. Is that Abiola Abrams? Yes. Rolando Brown, Mona Ibrahim. Mona missed her flight. That's why she can't. She's not here. She was in LA. She wanted, actually, she wanted me in the Nation of Islam came through, always. Um, she wanted me to mention that as a, she was the director of community partnerships. 
that she was so proud of the work that we did around the world because we inspired young people and we not infiltrated other platforms, but we partnered. We had a lot of collaborations. We partnered with the Arab Film Festival, with Hot Docs in LA, um, the Boston Film Festival, the Cuban Film Festival. Actually, we helped them launch the Cuban Film Festival. We helped um, a Brazilian festival launch. Um, so we, in the in the first year, we were invited to help um, develop these platforms, and so she wanted us to remember how powerful that was to do that when we came together. But we wanted to honor moms. We wanted to honor Paul Mooney. We wanted to honor so many others who just are not with us today. Um, Tamara, you want to say a few words? Because I think the last time you and I hung out with moms, you know, he was a brilliant, brilliant man. Many of you may know him from Oz. He was an actor in Oz and um, a wonderful poet, a real deep thinker. And yes, we're about to do questions, Q&A. So if you want to have a, a, if you like to ask a question, please line up by the microphone. We're about to open up, open it up, but. Yeah, I'll just give, give a moment for moms, um, who is a, 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 dear, a dear friend of mine and probably a dear friend of uh, you know, a lot of people on this panel. Um, for me, he was the spirit of New York, you know, at a time when New York was New York and it was raw and it was, it was, it was brilliant. And he captured all of that. Um, you know, not only from the work that, he, you know, uh, that he did on Oz, Sucker, Sucker MC is the play I think that you're talking MC, about, yeah. which is, I, I don't know if that's available anywhere, but it, it was brilliant. It was, it was a one man show, it was brilliant. But, you know, whatever can be said about his work, the person that Mums was, he gave everything, you know, to his art and to his people and to his friends. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, there he is. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we could pay a, mo a moment of tribute um, because what he gave, you know, to, to the city um, is, is hard to, it's hard to monetize, it's hard to, to understand. He really was the soul um, in many ways. Was and he rocked. He as a host, he was he was great. He was phenomenal. And one year he couldn't do it. Paul Mooney stepped in, and I bumped into Paul Mooney on Starbucks at Starbucks on 125th. I said, "Paul, moms can't do this. Can you do it?" He's like, "Of course. All right." He showed up, and woo, that was a spicy, spicy awards. I remember editing that video. I had to be very careful. <laughs> yes. Okay, we're ready for Q&A? Yes, and unfortunately, we only have time for two questions. However, there's going to be plenty of time in the reception to chat with folks afterwards. So we're going to go here and then there. Okay, go for it. Your question. Yep. Is it? Okay, we're ready. Um, how you doing? My name is Tamor Davis. I'm currently the library director of the Mount Vernon Public Library. So I have two questions. One of the questions is, um, what was the most difficult aspect of actually developing the archival collection in terms of um, making sure that everything was properly cited? Because um, you're talking about a lot, of, a plethora of information from periodicals, um, files to um, uh, digital information. So how was that process? And I understand that you had more than 100 people assisting with that process. And how was it managed, if you will? And well, actually, um, is Shala here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you? Um, I'm going to give you my card. We can talk offline. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. But everybody needs to know that. Um, but you have to be on a mic in order for it to be part of the recording. Okay. Um, and so we're going to let that be your one question, and we're going to go to this gentleman over here for his question. What I'm going to say is I'm going to give you my card, absolutely. Um, archiving is difficult. We all know because we all have our phones, and we create archives, right? And then technology changes, and we don't migrate our stuff, and we lose some of those precious, precious moments. I heard Martha even talking about the photographs that she has here. So what we're, what, it's a longer conversation. It is very expensive 
to do, and it is very time consuming. But I'll tell you what, Martha is an archivist, and we need more archivists of color. Because if we don't describe from our point of view, we get something else, and we get left out of our own history, or it's miswritten or mismanaged. And so that's my plug. Yes. All right, go on. Yes, and I could tell you that by the time I gave, donated the collection, I had a spreadsheet with all, you know, a, you know, a fair amount of metadata with information of the filmmaker. And, um, but when it came to digital, Digitizing the collection, that's Shala. That's, that, that was hard work, you know, like, like anything else, like even transferring from your phone to the computer, it, it takes time. Yeah, but we could talk about that later, but thank you for asking that question because we do have an archive that you can come and see. I know that we recently launched a, a finding aid um, it's still a work in progress. We are now going to reach out to the filmmakers so that we can make some of the video accessible online to everyone. Right now, you have to come to the Schomburg to actually watch the, the movies. And this will be the last question. Uh, I want to thank the panel very much for your presentation. The Schomburg's authenticity in showing the diversity of who the hip hop community is and the larger black community has been so instrumental in giving youth an idea of what is true and what is fake. I want to ask you as film people and festival people how you navigated through the major labels production of media images of who the black and hip hop community was and what you were trying to do with films and short films and documentaries. Do you want to, I mean, I could go, but I think, I think the filmmakers should go first. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Especially, I, you know, we worked at MTV. Yeah, um, I'll take a, a portion of that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the labels have an agenda. They have a look uh, of the artists that they want to put out and everything. And so I think with a lot of the content that was submitted, to the H2O Odyssey Film Festival, it was like a counterpoint and it was uh, nuanced. It was hip hop music, in some cases, independent, but it was really, you know, reflecting the elements of the culture that sometimes, uh, you know, the labels um, didn't go that deep. They liked the shiny trinkets, the flashy things. So, you know, so I hope that answers a Part of your question. Um, anybody else would like to? Elise, you were gonna? Oh. Real quick. We did a lot of, correct me if I'm wrong, not asking for permission and asking no for permission. forgiveness. No permission. To every point that you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, is that yeah. We, we were the counterculture. We were rebellious. We were adamant about what messages we wanted to send out to the community. It was about empowering young people, it was about showing another side of the story. And we, we, yeah, we, we did not care about that. But we invited a lot of the labels and media companies um, to join us, and they did. They actually enjoyed participating because they also wanted diversity in their companies. And so this was a step towards that. And um, I just want to give a shout out to my Universal Hip Hop Museum people in the house. I see y'all. I see y'all. I, I work with them as well, building their archives over there. Um, but at least you wanted to say something. Very, very quickly. Um, you hear a lot of jargon around equity, equanimity, and equality now. And what we were able to do, something that was also in the, a priority for us as we curated, was to show the equity. So it wasn't just about a particular stereotype or trope that you would see often in mainstream media reflecting hip hop. I don't need to go into what that is. Y'all know what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about. But we purposefully curated films and artwork and pieces that were created by those whom you weren't often, you wouldn't often associate with a particular image. So we showed young girls 
hip hop, but they're writing and they're going to school, but they're also working in, co in collaboratively with young brothers and they're working on an equal plane as opposed to one leading the other or you know, one, just one leading the other in that way, excuse me. That was very, very purposeful. That was very, with that intentional, excuse me, for us to do that. And a lot of what you see now, you may hear about those, oh, well now it's, it's no, we started 20 years ago and it really started prior to that, but we just knew it was important for community to see that, to see that uh, equal plane, so. Visual insurgency. Well, I know our, our time is up, and I just want to just thank you, Novella and Kalila and Shala and everyone at the Schomburg who always, 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 always show so much love to me and to every project I bring to you. This is really a gem in our community, the Schomburg Center. I also love to give a shout out to Dr. Khalil Mohammed, who brought me in as a the first um, hip hop scholar in residence, and actually I became a scholar here, uh, but I'd love to give him a shout out and everyone. And Terrence, we didn't talk about your films, your photographs. I wanted you to talk about that because you had the instinct yeah. to document. We, we, yeah, we barely knew each other and you were like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna document all this and did it forever. Well, this sounds like a part two when we're celebrating the 50th Absolutely. anniversary of hip-hop <laughs> in 2023. And actually, right? we are, you're right, because this is the kickoff, the, kick, the, the kickoff for a year-long programming um, program that we have scheduled. We're going to show 50 films. Um, we're going to have panel discussions. We're going to talk about you know, more, of, more reflections. And so, again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to this entire panel. Thank you all for being such an attentive audience. Thank you for coming out to the Schomburg Center's open house. If this is your first time at the Schomburg, as I always say, I hope it will not be your last. You now know a little bit about what is actually in the archive. It is free to you, to the community, no matter who you may be. All you need is a library card and for the most part an appointment. But beyond that, our curators and archivists and librarians will help you if you have questions or if you want to dig a little deeper. They're always a great resource. With that said, we have the awesome two out there DJing. We have some food for you all and hopefully together we'll bring the fellowship. With that said, have a good evening and please visit our website at schomburgcenter.org for more information. Take care. Hey, yes, sir.